sky, it's about 70 degrees outside on this gorgeous day. If you know, you know. <laughs> As the summer comes to a close, we celebrate our 31 esteemed undergraduates working in groundbreaking research and summer program at CLASS, that's Cornell Laboratory for Accelerator-Based Sciences and edu Education. Here with me today, I've got Carl Smolenski, our executive producer, to tell you a little bit more about what the CMS group does. Hi, I'm the U.S. Systems Engineer for the upgrade of CMS. CMS is one of the four major detectors that's installed at LHC. The LHC, or Large Hadron Collider, is a 27 kilometer in circumference accelerator, the largest in the world, uh, where collisions of protons are used to explore the basic building blocks of matter. The team here at Cornell focuses on upgrading multiple portions of the CMS detector, but the group uh, that I work in works on the inner tracker, or the part closest to the beam pipe, where we get our first peek at the particles as they uh, come from the collisions within the accelerator. The CMS group works on creating these structures called D. They're named that way because they look like a D. On these structures, there are 11 modules on one side and 16 on the other. These right now are heaters, not modules, but eventually they'll be fully populated with modules. These modules are silicon sensors that sense what a particle passes through them and sends that information back to get analyzed through these wires. Now, when you're making a D like this, you have to be worried about two things, radiation and high temperatures. The radiation caused by the collision will degrade materials over time, so we have to use radiation hard materials such as carbon fiber, carbon foam, and peak. The high temperatures are caused by the modules um, running and collecting data and overheating. So in order to manage this, we have a cooling tube, which you can see coming out of the top right here, in the middle in a flower pattern to cover the full area, that's sending two-phase carbon dioxide through the tube and collecting all the heat and sending it by boiling the carbon dioxide. Now the glue that puts all these pieces together also has to be radiation hard and thermally conductive. So we use diamond doped epoxy and a similar material also to secure the modules to the D. A lot of undergraduates have to work on this project, so let's see what some of them are up to right now. So Timo, can you tell us what you're working on for the CMS group? Oh, so you want to know what the gantry? Come here, come here. The gantry is a complex device that executes G-code paths. For example, this flower pattern inside the D, it executes the epoxy deposition inside the flower pattern shape. We can generate the new shapes on the gantry and execute them within the same day. After all is said and done, we've assembled two half Ds along with carbon fiber. We've placed the titanium tubing inside that circulates CO2 inside the D. And we have this, the completed sealed D with the tubing inside. And what about you, Jillian? What are you working on? So. Timo told you all about the D structure. Let me tell you about module testing. So first of all, there are two different types of modules that are gonna be essentially going on the D structure. There's a digital module, which only has a readout chip and a high density integrated circuit. Now, we can still read out information, but this is not the priority module that's gonna go on the D structure. We want a center module, which has the readout chip, the HDI, and the silicone sensor. Now, basically what happens is there are pixels that are going to be interacting with particles. The particles hit the pixels, that signal gets sent over to the DAX system that we have set up over here. And based on what tests that we're running, that information gets processed and analyzed and will be loaded onto our computer. And the whole point of module testing is we want to make sure that all these modules work perfectly before they get installed in the D structure. If we have one faulty module on the D structure, then we can't use the entire thing. We have to replace all of those modules. So it's super essential that these modules are handled with care and there's a proper procedure to make sure that none of them are broken and that we know that all of them are being tested. Now, we have two different systems that we're working with. We have a cooling block set up it's just a cold block powered up by the chiller. But what I specifically did this summer is I wanted to see if the module behaved um, differently in different set temperatures. So I set up this whole cold box system where you put either type of module in the cold box and through a Windows program, it sends signals to the electronics box. The electronics box sends signals to a component called the Peltier. Now Peltier is a component where it gets hot on one side, cold on the other. And when you send power over to it, 
it's it speeds up the heat transfer and sucks all the heat out of the cold side onto the hot side. So with that, we can manually set the temperature of the Peltier and we can run all different kinds of tests on that computer to see if the function is different or not. That's about it. Embedded cooling systems in the CMS detector need to be of low mass. This is because higher atomic number materials contain larger and more quantity of nuclei that may interact with the particle data collisions and cause some interference. That's why we're very interested in developing newer carbon fiber tubing that replaces the current metal tubing in the CMS detection. This is some of the work. In the process of manufacturing these types of tubes, we use these molds to corrugate the carbon fiber into the desired shape. After doing some vacuum bagging treatment, we get this result. This is a product carbon fiber plaquette. But as we all know, theory will only take you so far. So we're conducting a pressure test on the sample I created of carbon fiber tube. We're basically connected into the helium of gas pump and slowly um, ramping up the pressure. We want to be able to see for leaks and we want to record at the point of pressure where it, where it kind of ruptures. In this little experiment, the carbon fiber prototype is being submerged in a vat of liquid nitrogen. Temperatures here can reach as low as negative 196 Celsius. This test is very important because we want to see that the plaquette can actually withstand low temperatures. Low temperatures that are very normal inside embedded cooling systems in detectors. Impressive, but that's not all. One of our most critical student workers takes charge of all the 3D printing that's required to run our experiments. If you listen, you can hear part of work right now. Back at the studio, we have Manfredo who's working on a new coolant system. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so basically as particle accelerators and detectors get more advanced, um, we need stronger coolants to be able to protect against the hot electronics as well as the radiation coming from particle collisions. Uh, an important concept to keep in mind is something called thermal runaway. Basically what happens is that the radiation damages the silicon uh, sensors, um, breaks their crystal lattice, it creates more current. More current causes the temperature to rise, which in turn creates more current. And so you get a positive feedback loop in which the temperature is controllable. So right now we're using something called evaporative CO2. It's two phase. We basically get all the energy from the heat and boil liquid CO2. However, my specific job is to be investigating liquid nitrogen as a possible future coolant. One of our goals is to get from negative 20 degrees Celsius all the way down to negative 50. Um, I'm trying different options. We're, we're trying gaseous nitrogen, two-phase nitrogen, liquid nitrogen. Um, one of the benefits of liquid nitrogen as well is the fact that um, it's a very common refrigerant in today's refrigeration systems. Um, if you'd like, I can show you the setup downstairs. Yeah, let's, let's go. go. So if you check out our system over here, we have about a 58 centimeter tube, four capped on heaters, about one watt each. We have our chiller box, which will cool the nitrogen coming in and out. It's about negative 23 degrees. That'll cool the nitrogen gas to about zero degrees Celsius. We got our first thermocouple reader here. It should read zero. That's how we know it's working. Travels through the tube. This second thermocouple will read the nitrogen after it has passed through the warmers. We also have these two devices right here, a pressure gauge and a mass flow meter. Um, those will help us with the calculations later on. A lot of math here. Then we have the IR camera here which will be reading the surface temperature of these capped on heaters. We can then calculate how much heat is being exposed in, uh, into the air. Uh, all this is being read over here onto the system. If you notice, this is our pressure versus time graph and we have the temperature versus time graph right there. So I finished running nitrogen through the tube and I got some interesting results. So I finished running nitrogen through the tube and I found that nitrogen is not, nitrogen gas is not the best coolant. Um, if you can tell right here, we had an inlet temperature of about 13.8, outlet temperature of 19.5, that's about like a five degree difference, six degrees difference. Um, and that was about enough to absorb 0.8 watts out of four. So if you can note, if you notice in this chart, um, this first heater got cooled down pretty well, but then these next three heaters didn't cool down at all. Um, there are better coolants. Actually, I'm gonna send it to Rami, who can explain a little bit about what he's doing with helium. All right, so for my experiment, instead of running nitrogen through our tubes, we are gonna be using these bad boys filled up with some helium to 
flow through tubes with caps on heaters and then eventually with some carbon foam inside. And as you can see, we can adjust the pressure through these nozzles here. And then with our pressure sensor, we're gonna be measuring inlet and outlet pressures. And hopefully we can uh, do some more runs with different mass flows uh, thanks to this. And uh, we're gonna see if the helium can cool down our heaters a little bit better than nitrogen. And uh, just from some preliminary testing, we saw that we were able to get the helium down to negative 11 and a half degrees Celsius at the same conditions as Manfredo's experiment. So hopefully that's gonna show some good results. So uh, what we're doing right now is we're basically conducting a pressure control test, kind of. So without any of the heaters on, but with gas flowing, since we only have one pressure sensor right now, we're trying to figure out what pressure is the sensor reading depending on how much pressure we're putting through using the gauge on the helium tank because we don't know if this is perfectly accurate and so if we can figure out what pressure what type of pressures are coming out into the tubes inlet then while we test we can move this over here and conduct our pressure our pressure recordings uh, after the heaters to detect any pressure drops this is actually the results of some of our final testing and so as you can see here uh, just through some simple math we were able to without the foam remove three and a half to four joules per second and uh, then adding the foam into the tube we were doing five and a half um, five and a half watts removed from the heaters and so considering that the heaters are giving us four watts of power um, that's actually really good it's good enough to cool them down which is important because on the pixel modules they have these bump bonds that are very sensitive to heat and uh, I think I know a guy upstairs who's uh, doing his project on that stuff so he'll teach you more his name's John Well. So I am working with a simulation of bump bonds uh, the bump bonds are uh, millimetrical white pieces that are in the uh, model of the CMS pixel detectors so I am working to research uh, and explain uh, possible problems and solutions uh, that uh, uh, why the bomb bonds uh, fail at a certain temperature below the negative 30 degrees and I uh, looking for the simulation that uh, combines turtle def for deformation, elastic strain, normal stress, maximum stress to see um, the uh, simulation of these bonbons and uh, next I will do a four bonbon simulation. So this is like the uh, silicon piece that is in the uh, model that uh, are in the detector and this is the indium that are uh, pieces of indium and this is the silicon, this is like a connector and there is like a very sensitive to temperature and there is help to the model to detect the particles in the pixel detector. So there you have it. The summer students have been working on amazing projects during their time here with Jillian on module testing, Rami and Manfredo on cooling, and Miguel on tubing, and Genuel on simulations of bump bonds. We want to give a special thank you and shout out to the mentors who helped these students. Sean, Shika, Jose, Joseph, and Carl. Thank you so much for the support you've shown them over the summer. Uh, thank you for tuning in on this beautiful, sunny, Indica day. This is Sarah Hightower.